The art of avian flight is incredibly complex and sophisticated. It is one of the most energy intensive modes of animal locomotion and requires specific anatomical and physiological adaptations. Here we will explore the aspects of the avian skeleton that have been specialized to make flight possible. To start, it is important for a bird's body to be as light as possible. One feature associated with weight reduction is air-filled or pneumatic bones. The avian skeleton also shows significant fusion of bone, producing a rigid skeleton that is able to withstand the forces of flight. Bone fusion can be most clearly seen in the following structures. The distal tarsals and metatarsals of the hind limb are fused to form the tarsometatarsus. This is a characteristic shared with modern reptiles and may be an artifact of evolution of birds from reptiles. The distal tibia and proximal tarsals of the hind limb are fused into the tibiotarsus. The final few caudal vertebrae are fused to form the pygostyle. The lumbar vertebrae, the first six caudal vertebrae, the ilium, the ischium, and the pubis are fused to form the pelvic girdle. The ridge on the posterior surface of the pelvic girdle is referred to as the syncecrum. Central sections of the spinal column are fused into rigid blocks to cope with the stresses of flight. Because of this, birds are notoriously stiff-backed. To compensate, they have necks that are long and incredibly flexible. One of the most prominent structures found only in birds is a large keeled sternum. This mid-ventral keel is found in all flying birds and is an attachment point for large flight muscles. The two clavicles are fused to form the furcula, more commonly known as the wishbone. Another important feature in avian flight is the strength of the pectoral girdle, comprised of the furcula, coracoids, and scapulas. This strength prevents collapse of the chest cavity during flight. There are also seven ribs on either side of the vertebral column, each possessing an uncinate process. These processes form lateral braces between each rib in order to strengthen the chest cavity. These combined features are important skeletal adaptations that allow a bird to achieve and maintain flight. Evolution has specially modified the avian forelimb as a wing. Like the other special characteristics of the avian skeleton, it reflects the bird's commitment to flight. The pectoral girdle forms the point of wing articulation. This three-way joint between the furcula, coracoid, and scapula forms an opening known as the triosseal canal, through which the tendon of an important flight muscle passes. The humerus is relatively short and stout. This is because the main flight muscles of the breast attach only to the humerus, and it must resist large forces during flapping flight. The radius and ulna then form the support for the midwing. These are entirely analogous to the same structures in mammals. Most of the distal wing bones have been extensively fused and modified in order to strengthen the wing. The wrist bones, carpals, and metacarpals are fused into the carpometacarpus. The avian hand, or manus, has only three digits, the first of which, known as the pollux or thumb, supports feathers of the allula. In all flying birds, the breast muscles dominate the body so completely that they may account for almost a third of the total body mass. These are the muscles that provide the power needed to achieve flight. The supracoracoideus muscle originates on the keel of the sternum. It passes through the triosseal canal to insert on the dorsal surface of the humerus, producing the upstroke of the wing. The pectoralis muscle also originates on the keel of the sternum and inserts on the ventral surface of the humerus, producing the downstroke of the wing. It is the largest muscle in flying birds because it takes the most force to produce lift and thrust. There are a number of shoulder muscles that act upon the wing. These include the deltoideus, the coracobrachialis, the latissimus dorsi, and the teres major. Although the wing bones are extensively fused and reduced, the wing muscles are numerous and complex. Muscles of the arm and forearm act primarily as joint stabilizers and shape modifiers during flapping flight. Muscles of the brachium, or upper wing, include the biceps brachii, 
the triceps brachii, and the patagialis longus. Muscles of the ventral forewing include the pronator longus, the pronator brevis, the extensor carpi obliquus, the flexor carpi radialis, and the flexor carpi ulnaris. Muscles of the dorsal forewing include the extensor carpi radialis, the extensor digitorum communis, the extensor carpi ulnaris, and the ulnaris lateralis. The interosseous ventralis is a small muscle of the manus that flexes digit two. These combinations of skeletal and muscular adaptations of the wing are distinguishing characteristics among birds and are vital in the act of avian flight. The avian respiratory system is the most efficient in the animal kingdom. The primary functions of the respiratory system are to supply oxygen to the body tissue and to carry away carbon dioxide produced by high levels of metabolic activity. In birds, this process of gas exchange is crucial because the demand for oxygen during flight is enormous. The flight muscles must receive a large and constant supply of oxygen to maintain flight, and metabolic wastes must be removed quickly. Unlike most land vertebrates, Birds lack a muscular diaphragm to power respiration, and instead rely upon expansion of the rib cage to draw in air. When a bird inhales, air actually leaves the lungs. Fresh, oxygenated air enters the lungs as the bird exhales. The avian respiratory system is composed of the trachea, relatively small lungs, and usually nine large air sacs. These nine air sacs are extremely thin-walled and do not play a direct role in gas exchange. Instead, they serve as bellows to bring air into the bird and store it until expiration. They allow a continuous stream of air to pass through the lungs in a one-way flow, thus producing the most efficient respiratory system of any vertebrate. They are also connected to certain pneumatic bones, aiding the bird in shedding excess heat from its body as it breathes, which would be fatal if not removed. These air sacs include a pair of cervical sacs, a single interclavicular sac, a pair of anterior thoracic sacs, a pair of posterior thoracic sacs, and a pair of large abdominal sacs. All of the air sacs participate to some extent in the respiratory process. All of the posterior air sacs expand on inspiration, while all of the anterior air sacs contract on expiration. The path of a breath through the system can be summarized in four steps. During the first inhalation, the breath travels down the trachea into the left or right bronchus, through the lung, and into the posterior thoracic and abdominal air sacs. As the bird exhales, the abdomen contracts, forcing the air out of the abdominal sacs and into the lungs. Within the lungs, the air passes through parabronchi and eventually through air capillaries. It is only here where the exchange of carbon dioxide for oxygen occurs. As the bird inhales again, the air within the lungs is driven out. The now stale air passes into the interclavicular, cervical, and anterior thoracic air sacs. During the second exhalation, the anterior sacs contract. The air is then driven out into the trachea, where it passes up and out of the nostrils. This specialization of the avian respiratory system is one of the greatest factors in flight. Without this unique anatomy, the act of flight would likely be impossible.